tonight, the US Secretary of State in Kiev amid calls for American arms to fight pro-Russian rebels in eastern Ukraine. Also ahead, finally home after more than a year in an Egyptian prison, journalist Peter Grester tells his emotional story. High speeds and shots fired as two men in Queensland try to outrun police. And promising signs for Australian captain Michael Clarke in his bid to be fit for the World Cup. Good evening, Rachel Papazoni with ABC News. The US Secretary of State John Kerry has arrived in Kiev where Ukraine's leaders hope Washington will agree to supply weapons for their battle against pro-Russian separatists. At the same time, NATO defence ministers meeting in Brussels are expected to more than double the size of their existing rapid reaction force to 30,000 soldiers. That's likely to anger Russia, which denies playing a role in the conflict in eastern Ukraine, which has killed more than 5,000 people. NATO defence ministers have arrived in Brussels to discuss their response to threats from Russia, which they describe as more unpredictable now than during the Cold War. With the violence in Ukraine, the alliance wants to upgrade its response force in eastern Europe. We are bringing up the spearhead force, logistic points in the Baltic states like Poland, Romania, Bulgaria and the new headquarters in Poland. Today's decision will not only make NATO more flexible and faster but also stronger in its reaction. After a month of relative calm, fighting has resumed between pro-Russia separatists and Ukrainian troops and at an intensity unseen since before a ceasefire last September. At least four civilians were killed when this Donetsk hospital was shelled. There was a huge explosion. I was hit and fell down, and my son was walking here. This is my son. Six schools and five kindergartens were also damaged on Wednesday. The rebels say Donetsk and other areas under their control were shelled 26 times in one day. Ukrainian forces are still defending Deboltseve. It's a major railway hub, and if it falls, it would link up Luhansk and Donetsk, both already under rebel control. Meanwhile, the pro-Russians have been seen patrolling Vulahysk. The town sits in a pocket of government-held territory and was a principal target of the separatists' advance. Kiev and its western allies have accused Russia of arming and funding the rebels. And though Moscow denies any involvement, it's been beefing up its presence on the Crimean Peninsula, which was annexed by Russia last year. Ukraine's president wants Western military help. We can continue negotiations when we have a strong army which is capable of defending the state, because nobody will respect a weakling. I've said many times I'm a president of peace, not of war. The US Secretary of State, John Kerry, has arrived in Kiev for talks with Mr Poroshenko, who says he's in no doubt Washington and other NATO allies will agree to offer lethal assistance. Sajid Raniti, ABC News. After more than a year in an overseas prison, Australian journalist Peter Grester is finally home. He and two colleagues were jailed in Egypt after being convicted of airing false news and aiding an outlaw group. Charges all three have denied. Peter Grester paid tribute to the efforts of his family, who campaigned tirelessly for his release. Flanked by family, Peter Grester's back on home soil. Peter! Peter! And the smile says it all. I can't tell you how ecstatic I am to be here. This is a moment that I've rehearsed in my mind at least 400 times over the past, well, 400 days. In the wee hours of the morning, dozens of well-wishers and a media throng surrounded him at Brisbane Airport. Are you guys waiting for someone important? <laughs> <laughs> he wasted no time campaigning for his imprisoned colleagues, Baha Muhammad and Muhammad Fahmy. And I'm going to say this a million times, this is tempered by... A real worry for my colleagues. After more than a year in an Egyptian prison, he relished the open space and acknowledged the efforts of his family. All I've done is sit in the cell while, and write a couple of letters. They've been the ones to drive this and, and to be back with them, to celebrate this with them, has really been, has, has meant the world. Peter Grester says he's still trying to grasp the groundswell of support for his cause. 
And I thought I understood. I thought I got it. <laughs> These guys kept telling me, you don't understand. You just don't get it. It's, you, you can't possibly conceive of it. I'm so proud of my boys, our boys. I just... and the whole family. He says the Al Jazeera trio believed their ordeal was over last June when they fronted the court. Instead, they were sentenced to seven years jail. That was the toughest day of the whole, of the whole experience. Um, I don't think anyone, certainly none of us, expected it. We'd like to see his uh, colleagues uh, back in their homes as well, uh, but we're really pleased to see Peter Grester back. For the moment, Peter Grester's future is uncertain, but his passion for journalism remains. Um, do you mind closing your ears for a moment? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, I know what's coming. <laughs> I don't want to give this up, my job up. I'm a correspondent. It's what, it's what I do. During his darkest days, Peter Grester says he took his mind to the beach, and for now, that's where he'll spend some quality time with his family. Donna Field, ABC News, Brisbane. Senior Cabinet Ministers are publicly warning their support for the Prime Minister depends on him improving his performance. Tony Abbott remains confident he'll ride out the leadership strife and government policies are being rewritten to turn his stocks around. Here's political editor Chris Yulman. Running a cafe and being Australia's treasurer have at least one thing in common. What's the hardest part of the job? To please the customers. <laughs> to please the customers. Have... Joe Hockey's customers were none too happy after the 2013 budget smorgasbord of tough surprises. $28 billion of cuts are still hung up in the Senate, and with revenue falling, the return to surplus is retreating. And then will you make more cuts, or have you given up doing hard things because you can't do them anymore? No, we, are, we have to make savings to pay for our commitments. But with the government's political capital exhausted and the Prime Minister wounded by internal warfare, the economic message has been retooled. The talk of hard cuts has made way for a soft sell. There'll be a families package that will focus on better childcare, that puts uh, more money in parents' pockets. Uh, then there'll be a small business tax cut. And the volume on national security is being wound up the public want protection. But all the scrutiny at the moment falls on one man who's trying to stare down an internal revolt. I am very confident. Tony Abbott might sound confident, but he now knows that he's in mortal danger. Even if he survives next week's party room meeting, the peace settlement will be that he's on notice. His defenders admit that if he doesn't lift the government's stocks, his time is limited. His position relies on his performance. The free advice is ticking off the Treasurer. Stop engaging in commentary on colleagues. Stop engaging on commentary uh, on the leadership. Focus on fixing the country. One man is now the centre of attention. And, uh, and he can't avoid the obvious question. Would you like, though, to be the next Prime Minister of oh, Australia? I'm just going to focus on uh, broadband. We have a very good Prime Minister in Tony Abbott. No one has yet called for a leadership spill, but that could change in a heartbeat. Chris Yulman, ABC News, Canberra. And Malcolm Turnbull has defended himself against public accusations that leadership speculation is further damaging the Liberal Party. At a politics in the pub event on the New South Wales Central Coast, Mr Turnbull rejected suggestions senior ministers were undermining the Prime Minister. Tony Abbott has the support of his, of his members, Karen, myself and the rest of the party room and the government. Tony has had utter loyalty and consistency from his front bench. He has had more, loyal, more consistency and loyalty from his front bench than any other Liberal leader in our lifetimes. I mean, you know, all those years of the very successful uh, Howard government, Peter Costello was obviously a potential rival. And, you know, there were tensions blew up from time to time. There is no tension between Tony and any of his senior colleagues. It is a very, very cohesive team and we are all supporting him. So he has not been undermined by anybody, by any of his senior colleagues whatsoever. Anastasia Palaszczuk is a step closer to becoming the Premier of Queensland with a key independent pledging his support. Peter Wellington says he's backing Labor but warns he'll walk away if there are any corruption scandals. The LNP hasn't given up hope of forming government, saying key seats are still in doubt. 
Campbell Newman is still Premier of Queensland and today oversaw the induction of new police recruits in Townsville, but don't call him a politician. I'm not a politician anymore, OK? I'm the caretaker Premier. Right now, confusion reigns. Neither the LNP nor Labor has the requisite 45 seats for government. Pundits have Labor on track for 44, and today they added independent Peter Wellington. I am going to support Anastasia Palaszczuk um, with the Labor Party. But it comes with an important proviso. My support is conditional on the basis that there is no illegal activity, um, no allegations of corruption, but more importantly it's about providing stability to, to govern Queensland. To win him over, Anastasia Palaszczuk made four pages of promises, including an inquiry into political donations, lowering the threshold for declaring donations to $1,000 published in real time, a review of outsourcing in Queensland Health, sacking anti-corruption boss Ken Levy, halting the controversial Stage 3 expansion of Ackland Mine, if possible, and stopping the dumping of dredge spoil in wetlands near Abbott Point. Labor is still hopeful that we can form government in our own right. But today, can I just say, I am extremely humbled by the support that Peter Wellington has shown to me and the Labor Party. But she's not declaring the election won yet, waiting for results in Maryborough with Sunday, Fernie Grove and Mount Omini. It could be a matter of days, it could be a week. The LNP says Labor's Fernie Grove could go back to a by-election. Who knows where this is going to go and that's why we cannot say that uh, things uh, are certain. If Labor loses just one seat, it would be locked at 43 all. In that scenario, the two Catter MPs become pivotal. What we will be waiting for is all the seats to be decided. I mean, clearly that has to be done before um, anyone can say with any certainty which way they're going to go. One last formality for the Premier, handing over leadership of the LNP. That showdown is set for Saturday. Shots have been fired at police and passing motorists during a high-speed pursuit which started on Brisbane's north side and ended in northern New South Wales. Police say the armed offenders carjacked three vehicles and caused traffic chaos before their dramatic arrests this afternoon. 150 kilometres from where it started. Two shirtless men faced down on the Pacific Highway at Tweed Heads. The offenders sparked a high-speed chase through Brisbane's north when police went to a home at Caboolture this morning to investigate reports of a stolen vehicle. They fled in a car which hit a constable, injuring his leg. Police say the men carjacked three vehicles. The offenders then took, at gunpoint again, a woman and her young child from a four-wheel drive, where they quickly abandoned the four-wheel drive and again at gunpoint took a, uh, another vehicle, the blue car that you saw on your footage. Police pursued the blue sedan by road and from the air. From Caboolture, the driver headed south before briefly changing course. Police warned motorists in the area to steer clear of the erratic vehicle. On the opposite side of the road. As it ignored traffic lights and traffic lanes. Okay, on the footpath and most alarmingly, other vehicles. One motorist phoned police claiming the stolen vehicle had reached deadly speeds of 170 kilometres an hour. The guy's just leaving work and um, he was overtaking everyone at high speed. And He was flying. He was flying. Around 2pm, the sedan cleared the Pine Rivers Bridge, entering the Gateway Motorway. The pursuit ended when New South Wales police used road spikes. Shots were allegedly fired at police and passing motorists before the two men were arrested. A woman was injured when her car crashed during the police operation. She was carefully removed from her car and taken to hospital. Oh, it's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. It's ruined someone's day. It's ruined many people's day. Look at it. I just hope there's no one seriously hurt. In the aftermath of this incident, there is traffic chaos, with all lanes of the M1 heading north currently closed, while one lane of the M1 heading south remains open. The offenders are likely to be extradited to Queensland once they've been dealt with by New South Wales Police. Tom Forbes, ABC News, Gold Coast. Fire crews have gained the upper hand in their battle to save a town in Western Australia's southwest. The immediate threat to Northcliffe is over, but the search for answers has just begun. Locals want to know how the fire could grow so large, saying they've been warning for years that Northcliffe was a tinderbox. 
It was the break in the weather fire crews had been waiting for. All through the night, they kept up the battle to make sure the town of Northcliffe remained safe from the flames. They managed to save dozens of properties on the outskirts and stopped the fire front from pushing even further north. After days of uncertainty, residents were finally given the good news. We're now seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, hopefully that light looms larger as each day progresses on. While many have taken shelter in nearby Pemberton and can't yet return, those who stayed to defend are assessing the damage. Doug Bennett has lived in Northcliffe for 30 years. He managed to save his property on Tuesday night as flames 20 metres high bore down. When it came up the valley on the other side of the road here, it was, it was like a half a dozen express trains. It was really scary. Mr Bennett says he's been warning authorities for years that fuel loads were too high and more prescribed burns were needed. He's not the only one. The reason that this fire has gone so badly is because over the years, our government departments have had their arms tied behind their backs when it comes to defence burning. But the Emergency Services Minister says more burns wouldn't have prevented the fire. This is a fire that is leaping from the canopies of massive old forests that are national treasures. And reducing the fuel load on the forest floor, on the ground, would not stop this from happening. That's been ridiculed by the former head of the old Conservation and Land Management Agency. It shows a mere kindergarten level knowledge of fire behaviour, which uh, you would expect the Minister for Emergency Services to have graduated well beyond. Local member Terry Redman wrote to the then Environment Minister back in 2011, warning Northcliffe was a tinderbox. He says he's still pushing for changes. It's the only fundamental way to protect those communities from the fire risk. If we don't do that, uh, then we've got a serious problem that's just waiting to happen. Still in WA Southwest, and another major fire near Boddington remains out of control. It's believed at least two homes on the outskirts of town have been destroyed. Late today, the fire moved towards Quindanning, 30 kilometres south, and authorities warn the tiny town is under immediate threat. A thick blanket of smoke covers Boddington and its surrounds as hundreds of anxious residents get an update on a fire that's been burning since Saturday. The smoke was so bad, heli tacks were unable to fly overhead to help douse the flames. They can't operate because the smoke's so thick so um, they can't see the ground. Residents were told they wouldn't be allowed back into the fire zone if they chose to leave. A little anxious at the moment. It's a bit nerve-wracking not knowing where the fire is. A lot of people are out amongst very heavy bush country. Uh, a lot of farmers, hobby farmers, other people that are not in town but are in danger. So there's a lot of nervousness. More than 300 firefighters from across the state are on the ground. The focus is on trying to contain the fire. The weather conditions are forecast to worsen over coming days. This fire still uh, consumed 32,000 hectares with a with a 92 kilometre perimeter, so we're just trying to strengthen the containment lines we've got in place. Locals say two homes have been destroyed by the fire, but authorities say they're yet to confirm that. A temporary evacuation centre has been set up here at the local sports pavilion for any residents forced to flee their homes. We've been evacuated, so it's the not knowing uh, whether our properties have been burnt down and they can't give us that information, so it's very unsettling in that respect. An emergency warning remains in place for the southern part of Lower Hotham in the shires of Boddington, Collie and Williams. Jessica Strutt, ABC News. Investigators are trying to work out what caused a Taiwanese domestic airliner to crash into a river yesterday, killing more than 30 people. The chief executive of TransAsia Airways said the plane was practically brand new and is one of the most advanced aircraft of its type in the world. Piece by piece, the wreckage of the TransAsia Airways plane is lifted from the Keelung River. It's hard to see how anyone could have survived this horrific crash. It's even more remarkable when viewing the shocking video of the disaster. More images from motorists' dashboard cameras have emerged, showing the plane as it loses control, hits a taxi and a bridge, then smashes into the shallow river below. Fifteen survivors were taken from the plane, but more than 30 people are confirmed dead. 
More victims remained in the plane's front section, which was still submerged while workers tried to find a way to winch it out of the river. The CEO and other executives of TransAsia Airways have apologised and promised to do all they can for the survivors and the victims' families. TransAsia has been under thorough scrutiny on flight safety management by the aviation authorities since mid last year. So at present our planes and flight safety systems are following strict regulations. We also want to know what caused this new model of plane to crash, but I cannot speculate at the moment. The black box flight recorders have been recovered. Local media reports say the crew made an emergency radio call reporting an engine failure just before the plane lost control, although it will be some time before there's any official confirmation of the cause of the crash. Jonathan Flynn, ABC News. The two convicted Australian drug smugglers on death row in Bali have made another plea to the Indonesian government begging for their lives to be spared. Andrew Chan and Miran Sukumaran yesterday had their bid for a second judicial review rejected. They could be put to death within weeks. Indonesia correspondent George Roberts reports. As the distraught family members of Myron Sukumaran and Andrew Chan arrive to see them, the two men and their lawyers are still fighting. In just two sentences, Chan and Sukumaran have summed up their plea in a new letter begging for a moratorium on their executions. So we can have a chance to serve to Indonesian community and bring more benefit on the rehabilitation process in prison. They deserve to be granted some clemency because of the great work they're doing in the prison and many important Indonesians will tell you that. Uh, we're just unfortunately caught up in a, in a bigger storm at the moment. Of the eight drug smugglers listed for execution, only one is Indonesian. And the president has refused to be influenced by the mercy pleas of any foreign country, including Australia. The Australian government uh, has left no stone unturned uh, to try to ensure that these two Australians on death row uh, have their sentences Commuted. A Roy Morgan poll commissioned by Triple J has created controversy. The text message poll of 2,123 Australians asked, In your opinion, if an Australian is convicted of drug trafficking in another country and sentenced to death, should the penalty be carried out? A slim majority agreed it should. 52% of the Australian uh, people is uh, supporting uh, Indonesian uh, position. Supporters of Chan and Sukumaran are concerned it strengthened Indonesia's case for killing the Australians. But for weeks now, the execution of these men has seemed inevitable. The decision to deny clemency was flagged last year, and the government has been open about expecting Chan and Sukumaran to fail in their bids for further judicial reviews. The government is determined to press ahead with it, but hasn't said when. George Roberts, ABC News, Jakarta. Australian cricket captain Michael Clarke remains confident he will be fit for the World Cup. Clarke surprised many when he tested his troublesome hamstring with the ball at Allen Border Field today against Bangladesh. He moved freely for the Australian 11, but he's not quite ready for the big stage. In my opinion, I think I'm probably there's still a gap between where I am now and, and playing a one-day international for Australia. Um, but the fortunate thing is I've got plenty of time to, to close that gap. Clark hopes to play in Australia's final warm-up match against the United Arab Emirates. Perth Glory captain Michael Thwaite admits his team needs a drastic improvement from the last outing to beat Sydney FC on Saturday. The Glory goes into the match four points clear of Adelaide United and Melbourne victory at the top of the A-League table. In its last outing, Perth was forced to come from two goals down to claim a draw against the victory. Look, we just got to go from the last game. I think uh, we need a drastic improvement uh, after our last game against uh, victory. And I think uh, all the boys are up for it and, uh, you know, hopefully uh, Sydney don't like this hot weather. Saturday's match will be Shane Smeltz's first visit to Perth since he left the glory to join Sydney.
Former NRL stars Sonny Bill Williams and Israel Folau will square off for the first time in rugby union when the Chiefs play the Waratahs tomorrow night in a trial game in Sydney. The last time the pair met on the field was in 2007 when Folau scored three tries for the Melbourne Storm. It'll be Williams' first game for the Chiefs since returning to rugby late last year after his NRL stint with the Roosters. He's a great athlete, very powerful. Um, you know, you want to see, the fans want to turn up and see something exciting. And, uh, a guy like Sonny, who, who can uh, in defence, can can um, can put some damage on. Waratahs captain Dave Dennis will also play in the game seven months after having knee surgery. It was a PR stunt with extra bite. The six-time V8 Supercars champion Jamie Wincup got more than he bargained for when he stepped up to promote the season at Sydney's Taronga Zoo. All was fine as the 31-year-old driver nursed the championship trophy, accompanied by a non-venomous black-headed python. But smiles turned to grimaces as the snake took a liking to Wincup's right hand, putting a vice-like grip on him and leaving two painful puncture wounds. I somewhat knew it was going to happen, to be honest. It, it sort of it was, it was getting a bit rowdy, and uh, then it had a go. So I thought it would have released a little bit early when it realised I wasn't a rat, but um, no, it stayed on. Wincup said good. he'll be fine great. for a test event in Sydney this weekend, and delighted Holden fans by announcing a three-year extension to his contract. We don't have a great deal of cloud across the continent and we're not going to see a great deal of it over the coming week either. In fact, we've got very hot conditions set to redevelop through much of Western Australia, South Australia, Victoria, Southern New South Wales, the ACT and also Tasmania. About the only area looking at worthwhile rainfall over the next three to four days is along the Queensland coast, particularly through the tropical coast. So north of Mackay through to around about Cooktown, but the area between Townsville and Cooktown looking at the heaviest of those totals. We've also got humidity increasing through the east thanks to onshore winds around this high and temperatures slowly starting to rise again through the southwest of Western Australia. Could even see areas of smoke around Perth again tomorrow. Sunny and warmer across the southeast. And that is ABC News for now. I'm Rachel Papazzoni. Thank you for your company. Stay with us. 7.30 is next.